Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. It's a bet you make against the dealers at night, on the blood red of neon, on the black of the searching wind. And the circle spins, a whirlpool of gleaming laughter and splintered whispers, of shrieking steel and the silence of stone. You pray for a win, but it's no good. The red pays off in stained hands, and the black with dust in your mouth. That's how it falls on Broadway. My beat. At four o'clock in the morning, Broadway is still. The spectaculars drowse and the neons yawn. The sounds of the city whisper into the darkness. <laughs> and last night's headlines fight a losing battle with the wind. Then... It's a burglar alarm from the flower shop, and it's tearing its heart out. light of the florist's sign found her face, then lost it in the shadows, then found it again. She sat primly in a wicker chair through which garlands of camellias and shining green leaves had been woven. Her hand had been pricked by the thorn of a rose she held, and when the light found her eyes again, they were mocking and sly. Hey, hey, what's going on here, huh? Oh, hi, Danny. What makes? I heard a burglar alarm. Someone tripped it on their way out the back door. Oh, and left this dame here to heist rose petals? Roman Meshikoff, do something for me. Sure, Danny. Want me to book her? Call Homicide. Tell them there's been a murder. Hi, this is incredible, Mr. Clover. Positively incredible. Wait till the Florist Association hears of this. I shall be blackballed. A girl has been murdered, Mr. Kuffleiman, in your shop. Is that all it does to you? Please, Mr. Clover, don't teach me manners. I've been catering to weddings and funerals all my life. Remind me to plant something in your lapel. You see, you don't know this girl. No, no. Can't you do something about her, Mr. Clover? Move her or something? Oh, my beautiful blues. You take your filthy hands off those primroses. To me, Mr. Coupleine. Pay attention to me. The primroses will have to fend for themselves. Ah, this is an outrage. Making a shambles of my garden. All because you can't solve a stinking murder of some burglar of a girl. Don't press me, Kuppelheim. I could forget it says in the book I'm a gentleman. I know nothing about this, Mr. Clover. Why, why don't you inquisition my clerk? He closed the shop. He was here all evening. I've never trusted him, never. Nice boss you got, huh, Mr. Austin? The feeling mutual? There is mistrust and fright and kindness in all of us, Mr. Clover. Has it not been written in the book? Yeah. Yeah. What time did you close the shop, Miss Austin? At 11. I always close it for Mr. Kuppelheim at 11. And this girl, we found her to be a Miss Joan Gale of the Dunhill Apartments. Does that mean anything to you? Nothing, I'm afraid. If she were a customer, I'd know it. I wait on people and deliver, and I have a good memory, Mr. Clover. This lady was never in our shop. Why should someone bring her here to kill her? Oh, well, that's a wonderful question, Mr. Clover. I wonder you hadn't thought of it before. May I go home now? It hurts me to say this, but no... Your primroses will need you. And so it began. The questions and answers that a cop scribbles into his little black book. Against such a time when he can set up a file at headquarters labeled Joan Gale, Death by Murder. The coroner said she was killed by a bullet in her heart. That made me, all of a sudden, a philosopher. I had to inquire into what set of circumstances put the bullet there at that time, in that place. The next morning, I went to the Dunhill Apartments because Joan Gale's purse said she lived there. And I talked to a man because the yawning young woman at the desk just yawned and shook her head. Then yawned some more and pointed at a potted palm of the man sitting beside it who I should talk to. Good morning. My name's Danny Clover. Oh, that's nice. You got some beef, maybe? 
See the girl at the desk? I did. She's sleepy. Ah, you're a real quick lad. So? So that makes me an urban cop. A cop, huh? Well, that makes my name Frank Shepard, house man. Let's see your buzzer, friend, so I can have a genuine feeling about you. Yeah, here. Yeah. I did something you don't like? Joan Gale. I want to look at her room. Okay, come on. She did something bad? Go ahead, shock me. What'd she do bad? She got murdered. Oh, as bad as that, huh? Sad, real sad. And here. Joint screams at you, don't it? It's too dark to tell. Turn on the lights, Frank. Sure. Better? Oh, blue lights. What do you know? That, uh, that means something? She have many friends, Frank? Callers? Tell you the truth about that, Clover. Joan Gale never made me look up from the racing form. Her friends, neither. I wouldn't know. So, no gentleman callers. And I thought I was being clear as crystal. I wouldn't know. Who are you? All right, rummy, outside. You want to give this policeman a bad impression of Dunhill Apartments? Hey, wait a minute. Who's this guy, Frank? Uh, refugee from 109 down the hall. He greets the Gladson day with a crock. Yesterday, he stumbled into Mrs. Stutman's room while she had her hair in a henna. Didn't you, John? Huh? Oh, sure, sure, me? Hey, uh, uh, tell your friend, mister, that today you met good old John. Oh, that makes you want to fix my tie, huh? Come on, come on, good old John boy, baby pally. Outside, good old Frank boy, baby. I watched old Frank boy push his pally on his face into pally's home in 109. Then Frank Boy came back and was the model of a house dick with the economy size helping hand. We searched Joan Gale's apartment, found a lot of things. Things that pieced together the life of Joan Gale by night and by day. Things that made Frank Boy all happy inside. But there was nothing that added up to her dying in a bed of cut flowers. Back at headquarters, there were more fragments, more scraps of a woman's life. Sergeant Tataglia offered them to me. Uh, this is Joan Gale, Danny. She had a slight record in Scranton, PA. Hmm? For disturbances of the peace, for questioning, for, uh, well, you know, Danny. Yeah, the alibis of Kuppelheim and his clerk, Roy Austin. You had them checked? Oh, yeah, Danny, sure. It's just like this Mr. Kuppelheim and Mr. Austin told you. Kuppelheim was in the sack. The clerk, Roy Austin, closed up Kuppelheim's flower shop at 11 o'clock. Went home. To the knowledge of his landlord, did not leave the premises till you rousted him out of bed to question him at said Kuppelheim's flower shop. Hmm. How do you figure, Tataglia? You know, I'm glad you asked me, Danny, because I got a theory. Now, the way I picture this whole crime Oh, for a second. Is... Uh, pardon me. Uh, surely, Danny. Go right ahead. Thank you. Danny Clover speaking. They told me you were handling the Joan Gale murder, Mr. Clover. I believe I can help you with it. Who is this? Mrs. Amelia Ripley. 1219 Smedley Place, in Forest Hills, Mr. Clover. I can expect you immediately? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Clover. Now, as I was saying, Danny, my theory... Well, keep it on ice, Tartaglia. I'll come back for it. Yes? What is it? I'm Danny Clover. I'm from the police. Uh, Mrs. Oh, Ripley of called. I'm Mrs. Ripley. Please come in. Thank you. You won't mind. Well, that is, I hope you won't mind if we sit in the kitchen and talk. Not at all. This way. You see, it's the maid's day off and I'm cooking. A hollandaise sauce on the stove, batter in the mix, master. Oh, looks about done. It's the sauce that needs attention. Uh, sit here, Mr. Clover. Thanks. You said something about Joan Gale, Mrs. Ripley. I never saw her in my life, Mr. Clover, but I knew her. I don't understand, but... Uh, have a cup of coffee, Mr. Clover. I knew her because my husband knew her. Oh, I see. Of course you don't see. My husband sees her, then comes home to me. He comes home and strokes my hair and calls me wonderful names that I thought he'd forgotten. And he kisses me. Mrs. Ripley... I found out about Joan Gale months ago. I've always known it was a woman, but I just happened to find out her name was Joan Gale. Why are you telling me? Revenge is a funny word to be coming out of a housewife's mouth, isn't it? 
My husband is mixed up with a woman who's been murdered. I wonder whether I'm going to laugh or cry at what he suffers for it. It's important to me to know which I'll do. Pardon me. Where's your husband now, Mrs. Ripley? He called a few minutes ago. He said he was at his place of business. The Ripley shoe distributing business on East 37th. Well, thanks, Mrs. Ripley. I'll talk to him. Well, I'll show you to the door. I, I think I'm glad I talked to you, Mr. Clover. Oh, you did the right thing. Is this your husband? This picture on the bookcase? Yes, that's John. Good old John, he likes to call himself. Why, Mr. Clover? Does he drink? Why do you ask? But no, he doesn't drink. I'll say that for him. He doesn't touch a drop. Mm-hmm. Miss Clover, it looks bad for John, doesn't it? It's possible that he killed the girl, isn't it? It not only was possible, from where I stood, it looked like a sure thing. The picture of the John Ripley on the bookcase was the same good old drunken John who had tried to tie my tie in Joan Gale's apartment. The same drunken John who never drank, his wife said. I had to ask him about a little thing like that. About a lot of little things. Hmm. Ripley? boxes of the Ripley shoe distributing business lay in a crazy wanton pattern around the body of John Ripley. On his face was a loose, embarrassed grin as if he were ashamed of his clumsiness, ashamed of not knowing how to handle shoe boxes, ashamed of his torn coat, his torn body, of the blood that crowded through the bullet hole in his chest. Now there was nothing to ask of good old John, nothing, nothing at all. Listening to Broadway's My Beat, starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway is a place that can get happy about a lot of things. A wrestler from Argentina who walks on his hands and wrestles with his feet. The honeymoon of Tess Trueheart. And a couple of murders served piping hot for dinner reading. It's the diet Broadway likes. It's a fine way to get fat. My part of it was serving up a few crumbs to the gentlemen in the press room. An arrest is expected momentarily, I told them, and dared them to make six paragraphs out of that. They did, and it came out saying the police had no idea who the killer was. Or, as Sergeant Tataglia phrased it, Danny... I don't have no idea who the killer is. Well, the last time I talked to you, Tartaglia, you said you had a theory about who killed Joan Gale and Mr. Ripley. Oh, uh, Danny, I got a confession to make. Confession, huh? You killed him? Ah, uh, no, Danny. I had a theory, and I put it down on paper and added and subtracted, and the answer comes out that they killed each other. Only they died 12 hours apart. That's interesting. How did you arrive at that? Well, you see, Danny... You got company, Danny. I've got to see you right away, Mr. Clover. Oh, come in. Uh, Roy Austin, isn't it? Have a chair, Mr. Austin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Danny... Uh, don't go to Taglia. This is Mr. Austin. He's the clerk at Kappelheim's Flower Shop. Hi, Mr. Austin. How do you do? What can I do for you, Mr. Austin? I want you police to protect me. I... Yes, I demand it. Why, are you afraid of something? You would be, too. Here, read this. It was slipped under my door at my rooming house. Uh-huh. Dear Roy Austin, make no plans, Mr. Austin, because you will die within a day. Who'd want to write you a note like this, you know? Of course I don't. That's your job, Mr. Clover. Doesn't that note tell you something? Not much, except that whoever wrote it tried to disguise his handwriting. That's pretty obvious. Well, that may be, but it doesn't make me any less frightened. Mr. Austin, the department will give you all the protection you need. How? Uh, One of our men will follow you wherever you go and will... That's not enough. 
I refuse to leave this building until you apprehend whoever wrote that note. Mr. Austin. I refuse to leave this building. Okay, okay. We'll lock him up, Tatanga. Uh, sure, Danny, sure. Hey, Mr. Austin, uh, you play canasta? Uh-uh. Idiot's delight. Oh, a new game, huh? Well, maybe you can teach me. Where are you going, Danny? To the Donnell Apartments. There's a house detective there i got to see. Maybe he can teach me. <laughs> Idea of busting in, comrade. For this, you can get your face slapped, comrade. Turn around, Frank. I've got a complaint. I said, turn your merry ground chair around. <laughs> the man with the buzzer. No offense, Clover. It's just I don't like things sneaking up behind my back. Complaint? Yeah, big complaint. You. I'm a cooperative kind of louse, Clover, but not that cooperative. Explain it to me first. First, tell me how Mrs. Shepard's little boy has been naughty. Maybe you ought to stand up when I talk to you, Frank. So my words won't have so far to go. Sure, sure. Anything you say, Mr. Clover. See, I'm standing. You gonna wrap my knuckles with a ruler, teacher? That little play you staged with John Ripley. Four star, Frank. I liked it. Yeah, it was real sincere. Good old John. Play acts a fine drunk. On cue, too. Don't say. And all the time I thought good old John was crocked to the ears. He wasn't drunk, huh? Why did you throw him the cue, Frank boy? You've been working too hard, detective. Why did you do that, Frank boy? Why did you tell Ripley I was a cop before he needed to know? Why did you tell him to act drunk so it could look like a big boozy mistake is coming into Joan Gale's apartment? You need a place to lay your head, detective. Answer me, Frank boy. Answer me. Then answer. You were crocked. Thanks, Frank. Boy, I was praying for them. That's enough. That's enough. You didn't ask me my question, Frank. You saw a chance for blackmail, didn't you? Big, fat blackmail. I told you Joan Gale had been murdered. You knew John Ripley was her boy, so you arranged the act. Did he pay off before he was murdered, Frank, because you were so nice to him? Ripley murdered? News to you, Frank? Cross my heart. Hope to die. I, I didn't know about it. It had nothing to do with it. What you had to do with Frank. Tell me about that. Uh, uh, it was like you say. Ripley was slipping me a little gratuity all along because he didn't want nobody to know about the Gale thing. When she was killed, the price went up for gratuities. That's all. Did you get it? Yeah, from his wife. He, he didn't have it with him that night you was here. He, he, he called his wife. She paid me off, took him home. Don't tease me, Frank, boy. Oh, I swear it. I swear it on a stack. She took him home. The last time I saw Ripley, his wife was scratching his eyes out, and, and he was crying on my honor, Danny. Yeah. Get up off the floor, Frank. I want you to look nice for the boys at headquarters. Frank didn't look nice for the boys at headquarters. A guy like that could spend three hours with a barber, then dress in custom-tailored clothes, and still he wouldn't look nice. Before I left headquarters, I looked in on the canasta game between Tataglia and Roy Austin, then took a ride out to the housewife, Mrs. Ripley. I couldn't make up my mind whether to be sorry for her. I wasn't sure whether she had anything to be sorry about. I suppose you expected to see me in tears, Mr. Clover. I wasn't sure. Just how do you feel about your husband's death? Relieved, I think. Clean. If you've got any conscience about lying to policemen, you've got to feel some remorse, too. And you lied. You didn't tell me about paying blackmail and bringing your husband home. I didn't tell you, so I didn't lie. We can group it under the general heading. Maybe this will do something to you, Miss Ripley. You're in a lot of trouble. How? How am I in trouble? You're a murder suspect. Oh, Oh, you'd be surprised, Mrs. Ripley. We've had other coffee drinkers murder people. Even a file on murderers who made fine hollandaise sauces. But why should I... Why do murderers kill? You had the motive... Joan Gale, because she got along so well with your husband? Your husband, because he got along so well with Joan Gale? Mr. Clover, listen to me. All right. Mr. Clover, I first suspected my husband when he made an unnecessary trip to Scranton. Scranton, huh? Yes. John's business interested me. I knew all about it, so I knew he didn't have to go to Scranton on business. Go on. When he came back, he suddenly started to send me flowers. Just like that, flowers. Several times a week. That way, I knew exactly when he saw Joan, by the flowers. Flowers, huh? I suddenly make a stab in the dark. Flowers from Kuppelheim. Yes, 
Yes, that's right. Then, when my husband was in trouble at the hotel, I went there and did what you said I did. Simply because once I married John... You did that, then? I brought him home. He told me everything that happened between Joan Gale and himself. Everything. Uh Uh-huh. Then he left. Then I called you. I called you because there was the matter of my self-respect. You're telling me you didn't shoot either one? I didn't. There's a grocery store on the corner, Mrs. Ripley. You can go that far so you can get your coffee. I'm going where there's flowers. There might be an unfilled order there. Maybe you'll get some. have brought me in that torment, Mr. Clover. My heart bleeds for you, Koppelheim. Put those paddles down and talk. Gosh, it's no good. You've upset me so. A coming out to size. Just massacred. How long have you had John Ripley for a customer? Uh, John Ripley? The shoebox murder keys? Oh, yeah. See, that is a thrilling thing. How long was he your customer? Well, he began coming in about the time that clerk of mine started working for me. Roy Austin? Yeah. Oh, they got along famously, those two, always whispering about something or other. Then Mr. Ripley would place a very big order. <laughs> I didn't really mind their whispering behind my back. When did Roy Austin come to work for you? Why, Mr. Clover? Why do you ask? Is he in trouble? <laughs> I told you I didn't trust him. Uh, don't drool at the mouth, couple. I'm just answering my question. When did Austin come to work? Uh, it was about three weeks ago. He came to me with a letter of recommendation from some queasy little shop in Scranton. I took the chance anyhow because I needed help so desperately. Scranton. Do you have a letter? Yes. <laughs> yes, of course I have. Wait a minute, I'll find it here. Let's see. <laughs> ah, yes, you did. <laughs> here you are. Hmm. I've seen this handwriting before. Where's your phone, couple? It's right here in the counter. It's a business phone, Mr. Clover. Yeah, all right, I owe you a nickel. Here, here, what? Hmm. All right. Not too long. Sergeant Tartaglia. Danny Clover, keep Austin happy, Tartaglia. I'm coming up to talk to him. Oh, you can't do that, Danny. I'm not here. I finally persuaded him it was safe he should go home. What? Sure, Danny, sure. I talked to him that he should go home. Took a lot of my most clever ruses, but I finally convinced him. Danny, what's up? Maybe a guy who asked protection of the police, Mugovan, just to throw the police off balance. Huh? Maybe a killer. Let's go, this corner house. Hey, Danny, look. Guy just don't jump off the fire escape. Hey, that's him, Mugovan. Come on. In the alley. Good drop him. No wildfire over his head. Austin! Austin, stop! Hey, he ain't playing. Here he goes, Danny. Turn in the damn avenue. Yeah. We gotta catch him, Muggerman. We can't shoot in this crowd. Hey, hey, look, Danny. Into the building. He's running in there. I see him. In here. I will mean. I beg your pardon, lady. Did a man just come in here? A man in a gray sweater. In and through that door on the other side of the platform. Thanks. Stay here, Muggerman. Don't let him get out this way. Yeah, Danny, sure. down at me, down through the shadows, down the long flight of stairs. Roy was in darkness. That was the advantage he had. Every other step I took was lit up by the screaming light of a big electric sign flashing, Revival Tonight. It shouted through the window, Revival Tonight. Come down, Roy. My gun's empty. Come to me, Mr. Clover. 
up these stairs. Come to me. Pray, Mr. Cloak. Pray for salvation. Because I'm going to hasten your death with this gun. Because you're a sinner. Joan Gale was a sinner too, wasn't she, Lord? Yes, yes, she was. She was my wife, Stratton. Did you know that? No. Yes, she was. She was good. Until Satan came for her. That would be John Ripley. Satan? He took her away from me. And then he came back. And he told me where she was. Because he knew I would kill her. Because I am just. And the wages of sin are death. And you killed Ripley. Satan. And now you, Mr. Clover. But you must accept death with innocence. Like the lamb. Throw your gun on the floor, Mr. Clover. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do that, Roy. Here. When I got to him, he was dead. His body lay crumpled and broken at the bottom of the stairwell. On his face, the last drop of ecstasy, the ecstasy he'd reserved for his own dying. When I came for him, it was still there, but frozen now, different now, like some leering mask of evil. slips over Broadway like a black silk stocking splashed with sequins. And Broadway is as flashy as a showgirl on an after-theater date. But it'll be daytime in a few hours, and Broadway will wear a sleazy house dress and stand on street corners, screaming. Day or night, it wears any face you look for. It's Broadway. My feet. <laughs> Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover and is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The musical score was composed by Alexander Courage and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. And the program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The cast tonight included Charles Calvert, Irene Tedrow, Jerry Hausner, Howard McNear, Edgar Barrier, Herb Vigran, and Jack Crucian. <laughs> United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.